Hello and welcome again to Afterlife Topics and Metaphysics. Cyrus here, once again talking about complex, supernatural, paranormal, spiritual subjects that, that uh, some people like. Uh, affects everybody, so there's a good reason to be interested in these things. Um, no one gets out of here alive, as Morrison said, so we may as well figure out what happens next. So in this video, uh, I'm talking about the Maharishi effect. Uh, this is a couple. I'm going to basically do a couple slides from a much bigger presentation I did uh, for the students at Afterlife University. Uh, so I'm going to kind of uh, condense that down a little bit and introduce the subject to people because it's really interesting and not everybody knows about this. So it's like one more, one more um, red pill to swallow, I guess. Uh, before we begin, though, real quick, um, a couple notes. One, I'm sorry if my uh, screen is covering part of the slides. I don't really have room to format these for um, for uh, this kind of presentation. What I might be able to do, though, is move my box a little bit or shrink it down until I'm just a little tiny guy like that. And then you'll be able to see most of the slides. So, uh, oh yeah, and the second thing, if you're new around here, please hit the subscribe button to keep the channel going. It's, uh, it really helps support the work by subscribing and hitting the notification bell, maybe sharing the video. These things help the YouTube algorithm uh, recognize that people are watching this, which will make them or it will uh, allow for them to recommend the content to other YouTube users or else the only people watching this are just the people from the Afterlife Topics forum and you know, that kind of sucks because then the channel's not growing so I need your help with that. So the Maharishi Effect. The Maharishi Effect is very important because we've seen this demonstrated in multiple ways, not just by what was pioneered by Maharishi Mahesh Yogi in the 70s. The Maharishi Effect can potentially happen in a neighborhood, it can happen globally, it can happen between two people. Uh, what it is is focused meditation and tension on a situation to fix the situation. And um, you know, there's been multiple experiments about this and it's one of those things where if you look at the evidence, it's difficult to uh, relate this to coincidences. It's just uh, like other paratopics, like you go into levels of just statistical absurdity uh, to try to believe that these things are not, that there's no correlation between the, the actions of the medit of meditating and the statistical changes. So in the 1970s, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi spearheaded a movement where the square root of 1% of each of a country's population would meditate. For example, uh, to have an effective uh, result, um, the square root of 1% of people in the USA is 1,600 people. And this was how many people Maharishi Mahesh Yogi theorized would be needed to cause a big effect. After applying a specific a transcendental meditation protocols, they began a long-term analyses of crime levels and other effects. So as an example, after a, a Maharishi effect mass meditation, uh, like the one you see on the left with all these people holding candles, we saw the crime rate in Delhi, India decrease by 11%. And so the um, basically it's like the Maharishi Yogi Institute, I guess, that that. Uh, conducted the analyses. They're pretty rigorously rigorous in their scientific protocols, but I also recognize the criticism that hey, it's you know, it's the people doing it who are the you know the the, the jurors. That that's not a, a very objective way to to approach the situation. But I mean, it's one of these things where like when you're doing this kind of stuff, no one else is going to fund you. No one else is going to do the research. So I mean, so their own institute completed the research. But, I mean, they're pretty thorough if you read their papers. So, like, in Bedelhi, a detained analysis by an Indian police official showed that there were no changes in local police policy, no special drives on crime, no systematic transfer of police staff, and no apparent change in the number of criminals through externment or court clearances uh, to account for the 11% decrease. I'd like to believe that if they did have these issues, they wouldn't even report on the experiment. They would have said it was a failed experiment, but I don't know. 
And so they also did one in Metro Manila that resulted in a 12% decrease. Uh, the biggest Maharishi experiment in the USA related to, uh, let's see, uh, 24 different cities with 1% of the population practicing the, uh, uh, the TM protocols. This was done in 1972. And it was the experimental data was compared to 24 very similar control cities. Uh, the result was a bit curious because they saw that a decrease in, well, rather, there was a uh, increase in. Uh, oh wait, oh I'm sorry, yeah, that's the next slide. There was a, okay, there was a significant decrease in crime rate in uh, the 24 cities of 24%. They said that this study demonstrated that the Maharishi effect has immediate effect on crime. And the, the question in my mind would be, um, how long does this effect last? Everybody's meditating and this somehow this causes fewer people to want to kill each other. Like it globally raises the consciousness levels. But does that, does that go away the next day? Well, according to the U.S. study, uh, the effects last like six years. So more recently... Um, well, there was a big, big effect uh, experiment that happened to find peace in Lebanon. Uh, so there were 7,000 participants seeking peace in Lebanon through meditation and allegedly resulted in a 72% drop in crime. Uh, now, critics say Lebanon was about to peacefully resolve the conflict anyway. So, of course, you know, it dropped. But then uh, the flip side could be that the reason the war in Lebanon was resolved was because of the meditators. Uh, in 2008, we saw the peace intention experiments begin. Uh, this was by, what was her name again? Um, Lynn McTaggart. Uh, Lynn McTaggart wanted to fix some issues she saw with the Maharishi experiments, which, is, which was that the Maharishi experiments were very much coming from the Eastern Buddhist frame of mind where thoughts are bad. And it's one of various things I disagree with about Eastern religion or East Buddhism. Because I don't think thoughts are bad. I think bad thoughts are bad. And I think loving thoughts are creative and much more effective than having no thoughts, be, being a blank slate. And so this is you know, one thing I don't, I don't agree with about um, Buddhism so much when, in the way that they meditate. So uh, McTaggart attempted a different approach by using focused intention. So instead of trying to have no thoughts at all, what if you switch it up so you actually are thinking and you're focusing enormous positive energy and thoughts on a specific goal? Um, so the peace intention experiments were, were uh, focused upon as a smaller group of meditators, but using this focused intention protocol on the most dangerous neighborhood or area in America, which was in St. Louis, of course. And after extensive analysis of the area and predicted crime trends, Lynn McTaggart's team alleges that while oddly the property crime increased by 7%, their, but their focus was on violent crime, which decreased by a whopping 42%. So it's almost like people, the vibration was raised so much that the people who would have normally committed a violent crime, like they, didn't, they didn't feel like the, the, the ability to do it because of an unseen energy that was shaping their behavior. And so some of them were like, you know what, I'm just going to go break into someone's house or um, steal some lawn ornaments or whatever it is, but they're breaking into somebody's car instead of actually going out and hurting somebody. So it's interesting. It's like it's like the decision making process of the criminals changed. But that's a huge I mean that basically would have meant that going from the number one most dangerous neighborhood in the um, in the country, like decreasing that by forty two percent would probably take it off the list entirely. McTaggart claims the experimenters all had high likelihood of positive things happening to themselves as well. So she chronicled the mirror effect where the individual meditators all this positive stuff began happening to them. You know, estranged family members getting back in touch, good fortune, like all of this was being generated through the experiment. And uh, so I'll skip this slide. Uh, well, no, let's, let's go ahead and touch on this. Um, 
so there's a there's a kind of new agey complex uh, interpretation by the yogis involving quantum unified fields of un- unlimited intelligence, yada yada. But there's another theory which I lean toward has to do with multiple universes. So it's the it's the theory, and this is actually embraced by by the mainstream normie uh, scientism uh, advocates like the Neil Tysons who believe in multi, multi, the multiverse, which is that our own thoughts are breaking down different universes and creating different universes, and then we're, we're navigating through that. So when you have a positive intention, it's collapsing the negative universe possibilities and aligning us toward a uh, specific outcome we want. So we're like driving a ship through the multiverse, and if everyone's intention is on a specific positive outcome, it's going to collapse all of the other possibilities until we reach that positive outcome. So if there's a universe where somebody decides to become a criminal and hold up a liquor store and shoot the employee, um, you know, and then there's a universe where that criminal decides not to do that, and that criminal is like teetering between these two possibilities, the intent to focus positive intention is going to collapse that negative possibility and instead make make into reality the universe where um, they decide not to do that. So that's one what's one theory, but another theory is just higher vibrations. So just the act of meditating raises people's consciousness, they don't even know it, and they don't feel compelled to do bad things. And this is why the non-focused meditation that the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi was doing was still yielding some results. But what do you think? How can the Maharishi, the Maharishi effect change your life? How could this affect uh, somebody who's ill? What if you had 50 people doing focused meditation uh, on, on an intense level on one person to, I don't know, get rid of a tumor? So that's something to think about. Let me know in comments what you think. And if you like this kind of stuff, again, hit subscribe or check out afterlifetopics.com. You can check out books like uh, Understanding Life After Death, The Afterlife and Beyond, or join the Facebook group or get involved in classes. All that's on afterlifetopics.com. As a final note, you might be wondering, where the heck am I now? So behind me is a new apartment, a new Airbnb here in Jakarta, Indonesia. Um, as you know, I have, I have, I'm mixing up the backgrounds every couple of weeks because I'm moving to different locations. In a couple more weeks, I'll be in, uh, well, you know, I don't even want to spoil it. You know, you guys will find out once, once you see the video of where I am in a couple of weeks. So that's going to be exciting. But yeah, behind me is Jakarta, Indonesia, population about 10 million. Uh, Indonesians are such peaceful people. I don't even know if we need the Maharishi, Maharishi effect here because, uh, you know, I mean, let's say it's a huge, smoggy, dirty, concrete jungle filled with like the nicest, coolest people you'll ever meet. So that's that's why I like it here because the vibe is high. Even in a big polluted city, like you can go out and feel energized because everyone's so sweet and nice as opposed to Los Angeles where everybody wants to basically stab each other. You know, enlightened Los Angelites, you know, with all their new age books and doing yoga every day is the really kind of nasty, bad environment where Jakarta, where the annual, uh, monthly salary of most people is about 300 bucks, if even that, um, you know, is uh, the, the really peaceful and sort of higher vibe city. So it's something interesting. It's one of the reasons I travel is I need to get away from uh, certain American cities sometimes and, and move back to pl- other places. Um, and, uh, and another thing I find really interesting, I might even do a video about this coming up, is uh, the, the Islamic call to prayer. And uh, similar to the Maharishi effect, I wonder if that um, also helps improve the consciousness level in the city because... Um, we get to call to prayer like three times a day here in Indonesia, and it's this really beautiful music that plays throughout the city. And um, I had a girlfriend out here explain to me that, uh, you know, it's even you know the, the way you meditate or pray when the, when when the call to prayer comes out is yeah you focus you know you meditate. So it's not just about like hail Allah. It's like you know meditate on your life and what you're doing what your purpose is and all these concepts and think about it and then let the music carry your thoughts so it's actually a very effective meditation and i've been i've been doing it myself when the calls to prayer begin 
and it's really you know you really feel like connected to like everybody around you so it's really neat i really love the call to prayer uh, i don't agree with the fundamentalist religious aspects but i think it works in a city like this where people are not like super well, they're they are fundamentalists but you won't you know yeah there's some terrorists out here for crying out loud but just average indonesians it's like it's a more of a personal thing and it's not like the hardcore fundamentalism maybe in other places um that's a lot to talk about i'm going on a tangent get me out of here i'm closing shop i'll see you guys on the next video